the focus on this uh, presentation is going to be community acquired pneumonia. We'll touch a little bit on uh, hospital acquired pneumonia and ventilator associated pneumonia. Um, I know you guys have had a lot of talks and lectures um, on COVID-19. We won't focus uh, particularly on that. Um, I know you have all become very familiar with the presentation and treatment of that for the last nine months or so. So hopefully this will be a nice little uh, reprieve from that. Um, so getting started, uh, we'll do a, a case. There'll be some questions intermittently throughout the presentation where we'll pause and think about it and then go on with uh, some of the explanations. But this is a 68 year old woman. She has a history of congestive heart failure and mild dementia. She's admitted to the hospital from a nursing home uh, with confusion. She appears a little bit to Kipnik, uh, but denies any shortness of breath. She has an inter intermittent non-productive cough. It is not clear whether it's different than her baseline line on exam. She's lethargic, but easily aroused. Uh, her temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. She's tachycardic. Her blood pressure is 108 over 64. Respiratory rate 24, she's satting 90% on room air. JVP is difficult to assess. Possible crackles in the bases and some lower extremity edema. She has a white count of 10.2, hematocrit of 32, platelets 240, sodium 130, creatinine 1.4. Her LFTs are normal. Her UA uh, has four to six white cells per high powered field and a portable chest x-ray shows edema plus or minus a left lower lobe infiltrate. Here's a picture of her uh, chest x-ray from admission. And so you're the admitting resident. So the question is, does this patient have pneumonia? And yes, no, or just as equally um, possible is uh, that you have no clue. And the next question is, would you start antibiotics? Yes or no? And I think this, uh, this kind of ties into where um, it can be difficult to determine whether admitting somebody to the hospital, if they have a uh, pneumonia or not. And there was an article from JAMA in 2014 that was looking at indications for antibiotics in over 4,000 patients at um, 183 hospitals. And respiratory tract infections were the most often cited indication at 35%. Um, followed by uh, UTI, skin and soft tissue infection, GI infection, and then bloodstream infection. And I think why is pneumonia so difficult to diagnose is because a lot of medical conditions in hospitalized patients um, can present with the same clinical signs as pneumonia, whether it be radiographic opacities, fever, abnormal white count, uh, impaired oxygenation, or increased pulmonary secretions. Um, in terms of some epidemiology, it's a significant cause of morbidity or mortality in the U.S. Um, there are certain conditions uh, that increase the likelihood of developing CAP, um, and they, likewise, they can influence the causative organisms as well. Um, but those types of conditions would be COPD, alcoholism, smoking, bronchiectasis, and then as you age, um, the rates of CAP increase with age and prevalence appears higher among uh, African Americans as well as among men than in women. So first question for you guys, uh, a 68 year old woman admitted to the hospital for two days of fever, increasing dipsy and worsening cough. She was diagnosed with the flu uh, about three weeks ago. She had stayed home from work following her diagnosis and was beginning to recover when her current symptoms began. She started with fever and began noticing increasing shortness of breath, her cough, which had almost resolved, returned, and has been productive of moderate amounts of gray colored sputum. Her history is significant for hypertension, and she takes hydrochlorothiazide. On exam, she's febrile to 38.1. Her blood pressure is 136 over 82. Her heart rate is 89, and her respiratory rate is 28. She's 90% on room air, and her lung exam shows diffuse ronchi. Cardiac and abdominal exams are, are normal. And she has bilateral cavitary infiltrates on imaging. And so the question is asking what the most likely causative organism is going to be. And I'll give you guys just a couple minutes to, to think about it. 
And so the correct answer is going to be Staph aureus. Um, the key point for this question is a patient with recently diagnosed influenza, pneumonia, and cavitary lesions on chest imaging most likely has Staph aureus post-influenza community-acquired pneumonia. Um, when infection uh, develops in the lower respiratory tract, uh, the pulmonary and host defenses have been breached, um, leading to entry of microorganisms present in the upper respiratory tract into the usually sterile uh, lower respiratory uh, airways. Uh, because of this, the most common microorganisms causing CAP uh, represent typical colonizers present in the upper respiratory tract. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so the most common organism causing CAP is going to be strep pneumo. Other important causes include uh, mycoplasma pneumonia, haemophilus, uh, chlamydia pneumonia, and other respiratory viruses. Um, obviously, respiratory viruses are an important contributor to CAP, uh, particularly influenza, A and B viruses, uh, and now COVID-19. Other respiratory viral pathogens including RSV, parainfluenza, and adenoviruses are a substantial source of <coughs> morbidity from viral CAP. These viral infections can also lead to complications of both post-viral bacterial superinfection, uh, most commonly with uh, Staph aureus, um, strep pneumonia, and H. influenza. Atypical community-acquired pneumonias are pathogens uh, such as mycoplasma pneumonia, Legionella species, uh, the chlamydia pneumonia, um, often clinically indistinguishable from typical CAP syndrome. Uh, Legionellosis is particularly notable for outbreaks where source of exposure is traced back to equipment or devices that aerosolize the organism, such as uh, air conditioning towers. In terms of gram-negative bacteria, that includes uh, organisms like club pneumo, pseudomonas, aeruginosa, acinetobacter, E. coli, uh, enterobacter species. Uh, they're typically not implicated in community-acquired pneumonia. Most patients with this that are caused by gram-negative bacteria, they'll have predisposing risk factors like bronchiectasis, uh, COPD, cystic fibrosis, um, and they typically will develop severe pneumonia that can oftentimes necessitate uh, more higher level of care, such as in the ICU. And Staph aureus uh, community acquired pneumonia, it can occur in a heterogeneous group of settings. Uh, Post influenza, as that previous question alluded to, bacterial pneumonia syndrome is typically attributed to, to Staph aureus. Um, although strep pneumo can uh, lead to this complication as well. Um, older adult patients are also susceptible to Staph aureus uh, cap. Um, this type of pneumonia is commonly seen as well in injection drug users. Uh, MRSA as a cause of cap more commonly incurs with nosocomial exposures and in certain patient populations such as those undergoing dialysis, uh, recent nursing home exposure, and exposure to persons with skin and soft tissue infection are also uh, risk factors for MRSA. Uh, the morbidity from MRSA causing uh, community-acquired pneumonia is pretty substantial uh, because a significant proportion of patients present with a, a necrotizing pneumonia in which a portion of the involved lung tissue becomes devitalized. The complication leads to pulmonary airway hemorrhage uh, severe respiratory failure and uh, oftentimes fulminant clinical deterioration. And so um, when considering a microbiologic cause of pneumonia and MRSA in particular, uh, a question that often I think comes up is would having a nasal uh, or nasal swab for MRSA help? And uh, maybe yes, no, or maybe so. Um, but this article from uh, the clinical infectious diseases in 2019, or I'm sorry, 2018, looking at the clinical utility of MRSA nasal screening uh, to rule out uh, MRSA pneumonia. It was a meta-analysis of 22 studies uh, and over 5,000 patients. The pooled sensitivity and specificity for MRSA uh, 
community acquired pneumonia and healthcare associated pneumonia was 85% and 92% respectively. And for CAP and uh, HCAP, both the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value increased um, with the negative predictive value being about 98%. Uh, and so I think in conclusion, uh, nasal screening for MRSA uh, had a high specificity and nasal and negative predictive value for ruling out MRSA pneumonia, particularly in cases of CAP or uh, healthcare associated type pneumonias. Um, and based on the negative predictive value, MRSA NARE screening is a valuable tool for antimicrobial stewardship to streamline empiric therapy, especially among patients with pneumonia who are not colonized with MRSA. I think one thing to, to take make note of here, especially at Georgetown is um, they don't do MRSA NARE's PCR testing um, they do a nasal culture. And so if the patient has previously been on vancomycin, uh, that will affect the culture. Um, whereas with the PCR testing, it's not, uh, as, it's not affected. And so our next question is uh, a 75 year old gentleman evaluated in the ED for fever, productive cough and shortness of breath of five days duration. His history is significant for type two diabetes. He's never smoked and does not drink alcohol. Um, <coughs> he's only on metformin. His exam is, uh, he's febrile to 39.2. His blood pressure is 95 over 65. His heart rate is 110 and his uh, respiratory rate is 32. His oxygen saturation is 83% breathing room air and rises to 94% with 30% oxygen by face mask. His BMI is 29. His pulmonary exam reveals decreased breath sounds and crackles at the left lung base. And the remainder of exam, including mental status, is normal. Lab studies show a white count of 18. A BMP is normal. His blood cultures are pending. Chest radiograph shows left lower lobe consolidation. And the patient is transferred to the ICU and empiric antibiotics are started. And so the question is, what would you what would you want to do next? Would you want to get a CRP, a chest CT, a procal, or sputum cultures? And the, the correct answer actually is uh, to get sputum cultures. Um, and the key point is patients with severe community acquired pneumonia should have sputum cultures and blood cultures performed as part of their further diagnostic testing. Um, the diagnosis uh, obviously for pneumonia includes comprehensive HMP. Suggestive symptoms include fever, cough, sputum production, dyspnea, although um, all this is only 50% sensitive for diagnosis of CAP. If clinical findings are suggestive, a chest x-ray should be performed. Typical findings might include interstitial infiltrates, a low bar consolidation or cavitary lesions. Um, empiric antibiotics for CAP generally not recommended without evidence of positive findings on chest x-ray, although it might be started in hospitalized patients with a high clinical suspicion when the initial chest x-ray is negative with repeat imaging in one or two days, maybe after volume repletion uh, to confirm or exclude the diagnosis. Um, I think a question that might sometimes come up is whether or not you should get a CT scan as well. Uh, they do have higher sensitivity than chest x-ray for diagnosing uh, CAP, um, and it's particularly effective for detecting interstitial infiltrates, empyema, cavitary lesions, or higher lymphadenopathy, but no evidence ex indicates clinical outcomes are improved by using CT for diagnosing uh, community-acquired pneumonia. It's also substantially more expensive than plain chest radiography and involves more radiation exposure. Therefore, the, the guidelines don't recommend its use in most patients with CAP, and it's reserved for specific clinical situations in which diagnostic uncertainty uh, will affect management. In terms of sputum cultures, the, the diagnostic yield uh, varies widely. Uh, culture data for ambulatory patients with uncomplicated pneumonia do not positively influence outcomes relative to empiric therapy. And so sputum cultures are not recommended for these patients. They're indicated for hospitalized patients, those with severe disease, um, those with complications such as pleural effusion, cavitary lesion, underlying lung disease, uh, other certain conditions or unsuccessful outpatient therapy. Blood cultures uh, are 
positive in just a few cases of community acquired pneumonia. They're not recommended uh, as well for ambulatory patients. Um, they should be performed in, in the patients that have an indication for sputum culture and obviously obtained uh, before empiric therapy. Uh, most positive blood cultures in a hospitalized patients with community acquired pneumonia will likely be positive if they're going to be for uh, strep pneumonia. Uh, other testing that we often see um, in pneumonia is Legionella and pneumococcal urine antigen testing. It's recommended when confirmation of uh, a microbiologic diagnosis is indicated, when ICU admission is being considered, and when outpatient therapy fails. Uh, of note, the Legionella urine antigen, uh, it is specific, uh, but it only detects Legionella pneumophila type 1, and so it's going to be less sensitive because of that. Um, Respiratory viral panels and other molecular tests are uh, certainly useful because they are fast and accurate. Uh, they can lead to reduction of unnecessary antibiotics and additional testing when they elicit a diagnosis. Um, procalcitonin is often uh, becoming more and more uh, utilized. It's an emerging area of interest in the evaluation of CAP. Um, it can help differentiate between bacterial and non-bacterial pneumonia. It's produced by cells as a response to bacterial toxins, which result in serum procalcitonin elevations in the setting of bacterial infections. In viral infections, this isn't the case, and so procalcitonins will be uh, reduced. And so potentially can be used to help reduce unnecessary antibiotic use uh, as it can assist in the decision to stop empiric therapy for presumed CAP but should only be considered uh, as an adjunctive diagnostic tool to support uh, clinical microbiologic and radiologic data rather than pre take precedence over other information itself. Um, this is uh, from the most recent uh, CAP guidelines that were uh, released last year uh, in terms of initial treatment strategies for outpatients with community acquired pneumonia. Um, and it's really broken up uh, to help you out with, with patients who don't have comorbidities or risk factors for MRSA or pseudomonas. Um, it gives you some recommendation guidelines in terms of amoxicillin or doxycycline or possibly a macrolide based on pneumococcal resistance. Um, and then if you do have comorbidities, uh, which would include chronic heart, lung, liver, or kidney disease, diabetes, alcoholism, malignancy, uh, those types of things. So probably most of the patients that you're going to see, uh, you've got Augmentin as an option or a cephalosporin and a macrolide or doxy or potentially monotherapy with a respiratory quinolone. This is a little bit more in-depth uh, table looking at initial treatment strategies for patients with community acquired pneumonia by level of severity and risk for drug resistance. And um, it's sort of helps to break it down in terms of non-severe pneumonia versus severe pneumonia. The standard regimen is going to be pretty comparable, whether it be a beta-lactam plus a macrolide or a respiratory fluoroquinolone <clears throat> um, in terms of non-severe uh, pneumonia or in severe inpatient pneumonia, you have a beta-lactam plus macrolide or a beta-lactam plus uh, for fluoroquinolone. And then whether or not to add MRSA coverage or pseudomonal coverage will uh, empirically will depend on the severity of the pneumonia, of the pneumonia, their uh, prior risk factors, that sort of thing. But I think what this slide is getting away from is the previous uh, designation of HCAP uh, is no longer utilized and whether or not to include coverage for what was typically considered HCAP is going to be based uh, not only on the severity of their pneumonia, but uh, prior respiratory isolates and um, their other wise uh, risk factors. And so the patient uh, uh, that we previously talked about from the nursing home, uh, going back to their, their case, um, previously she would have been categorized, categorized as HCAP and given uh, vancomycin and zosin, and so do they need that type of coverage? <coughs> Sorry, this is, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, another interesting study that was done at the VA um, 
where they looked at trends in antibiotic use and uh, nosocomial pathogens in hospitalized veterans with pneumonia at 128 uh, medical centers between 2006 and 2010. And uh, the overall proportion of hospitalizations with positive cultures uh, was 2.2% for MRSA, 2% uh, for Pseudomonas, and 0.2% uh, for Acinetobacter. Of the positive cultures, 88% were positive for MRSA, 96% for Pseudomonas, and 76% for Acinetobacter were from a respiratory source. Um, this study showed a substantial increase in the use of both vancomycin and zosin from 2006 uh, to 2010 with no increase in positive cultures for MRSA, Pseudomonas, or Acinetobacter, but with a treatment to prevalence ratio of uh, 50 to 1. The, the next, I guess, topic to, to sort of uh, transition to is uh, whether to transition from IV to PO therapy. And clinically stable patients are categorized as having a temperature of 37.8 or less, um, a heart rate of 100 or less, respiratory rate of 24 or less, and systolic blood pressure of 90 or greater, uh, arterial oxygen saturation of 90% or more, or, or partial pressure of oxygen of 60 millimeters mercury or greater breathing room air, an ability to maintain oral intake and normal mental status. And those hospitalized patients who meet those criteria initially treated with IV therapy can be switched to PO agents. Um, generally, it's of the same antimicrobial class and with similar spectrum of activity. Um, continued in-hospital monitoring of these patients following the transition from IV to PO therapy has not been shown to improve outcomes. And if a specific pathogen is identified, the empiric regimen should be tailored to that isolated organism. The, for outpatient community-acquired pneumonia, long, longer treatment courses have not shown clinical benefit and should be avoided to minimize unnecessary antimicrobial use and avoid extra expensive care. Secondary symptoms of CAP, such as cough, fatigue, other constitutional symptoms might persist for several days after completion of antimicrobial treatment, but the ongoing presence of these symptoms in the absence of continued fever does not mandate extending the course of therapy. And so that's typically going to be five days for uh, outpatient uh, coverage. For hospitalized uh, patients, the total course of antibiotic therapy should continue until the patient has been afebrile for at least 48 to 72 hours, uh, does not require supplemental O2, and does not have more than one sign of clinical instability. Um, total duration in hospitalized patients who respond clinically within the first two days of treatment is generally not longer than five to seven days. And obviously complications that we see sometimes with uh, pneumonia, such as lung abscesses, empyema, extra pulmonary infections, that will mandate longer courses of therapy dependent on uh, the complication. This study um, out of JAMA in 2016 indicates that the, uh, the IDSA or ATS guy, uh, recommendations for shorter duration of antibiotic treatment based on clinical stability criteria can be safely implemented in hospitalized patients with CAP, uh, thus leading to a significant reduction in treatment duration. Uh, it was a randomized controlled trial in four hospitals in Spain uh, 312 patients with CAP were randomized to stopping antibiotics on day five versus usual care with a median of 10 days. Um, antibiotics were stopped uh, if, the if they were afebrile for greater than 48 hours and had less than uh, one sign of clinical instability. Uh, another question I think that comes up a lot in the hospital um, for you guys is if a patient uh, aspirates and they have aspiration pneumonitis, uh, do they require antibiotics? And this was a, another article from CID in um, which they looked at prophylactic antimicrobial therapy for acute aspiration pneumonitis. 
and uh, it was a retrospective analysis. It was in 2018, um, retrospective analysis of antibiotics versus supportive care uh, for patients with aspiration pneumonitis. And the groups were similar in their demographics, um, their comorbidities and their risk factors for aspiration. And uh, basically antibiotic treatment was associated with no difference in hospital mortality uh, as well as no difference in ICU transfer. Um, there were fewer antibiotic free days, uh, understandably, and then obviously more antibiotic escalation. Um, but the key was the no difference in mortality or ICU transfers. Um, and so I think this is an important thing to remember that not every aspiration uh, pneumonitis requires uh, treatment or escalation of antibiotics. Um, whether or not to get a, a follow-up chest X-ray, um, according to the Mixac, Mixap 17, as well as the 2019 CAP guidelines, not necessarily. Um, findings on imaging can often linger despite clinical improvement and symptom resolution. The routine use of follow-up chest imaging after successful treatment is not generally recommended, uh, and it is found to have the greatest utility in patients older than 50 years old, particularly for men and for smokers. And these subset of patients who do require uh, follow-up imaging, the post-treatment follow-up should be done uh, two to three months after um, initial antibiotic treatment. Um, a little bit on ventilator-acquired uh, pneumonia as well as hospital-acquired pneumonia. Um, HAP would be defined as a pneumonia that's occurring more than 48 hours after admission that was not incubating at, at the time of admission. It does account for uh, the second most common hospital acquired infection, about 15%, um, has an estimated attributable mortality rate of 27 to 50% and is associated with increased length of stay. And ventilator associated pneumonia will develop 48 hours after endotracheal intubation. It's the most common hospital acquired infection in critically ill patients. Bacteria are gonna be the most commonly isolated pathogens with viral and fungal also playing a role primarily uh, in those who are immunocompromised. Um, early onset, uh, such as less than five days after admission or intubation, uh, will generally result from antimicrobial sensitive organisms, whereas later onset, such as greater than five days, is more likely gonna be with a multi-drug resistant organism. This table I took out of MixApp just kind of looks at the risk factors for hospital and ventilator associated pneumonia. There's some modifiable risk factors on there and then there's some non-modifiable risk factors, but the most important or most significant risk factor is gonna be intubation and mechanical ventilation. Uh, in patients receiving mechanical ventilation, the incidence of HAP or VAP increases uh, six-fold to 21-fold. Um, clinical findings are going to include temperature greater than 38, leukocytosis or leukopenia, purulent sputum, as well as a decrease in arterial oxygen saturation. A new or progressing lung infiltrate on chest radiograph is also required. If clinical findings are present without radiographic findings, tracheobronchitis should also be considered. Um, but it can be a difficult uh, diagnosis to make because otherwise there's not a lot of reliable tests to exist to make a definitive diagnosis. Um, it is based on what I was describing as far as clinical radiographic and microbiologic findings. Um, and hopefully specimen from a lower respiratory tract uh, can be obtained before starting at, uh, empiric antibiotics. Um, this question is a 23 year old woman evaluated in the ICU. She was in a motor vehicle accident seven days ago and has required mechanical ventilation since that time. She now has fever, an increased oxygen requirement and increased respiratory secretions requiring suctioning every hour. Uh, three other patients in the ICU are colonized or infected with uh, ESBL producing club pneumo. Her history is unremarkable. On exam, uh, her temperature is 39. She's blood pressure is 105 over 70. Uh, heart rate is 110 and her respiratory rate is 16. Her pulmonary exam reveals scattered bronchi. On cardiac exam, 
our heart, the heart is hyperdynamic, but otherwise normal. Her trauma sites are clean and dry. Uh, lab studies, she has a white count of 19,300. Sputum gram stain reveals uh, two plus leukocytes and three plus gram negative rods. Sputum culture is pending, blood cultures return no growth. Um, her chest imaging shows a new right lower lobe infiltrate. And so the question is getting to uh, what is your empiric uh, antibiotic coverage in this patient? And the correct answer for this is gonna be miropenem. Um, the key point uh, for this question in particular is carbapenems, such as uh, one that we're familiar with here, miropenem obviously is the appropriate choice for empiric therapy in patients with ventilator associated pneumonia likely caused by an extended spectrum beta lactamase producing enterobacteriaceae species. Um, the treatment for uh, HAP or VAP includes empiric coverage for Staph aureus, including MRSA, um, Pseudomonas, and other gram negative bacilli. Um, there's uh, no evidence indicates that HAP or VAP caused by Pseudomonas uh, species requires combination therapy or that a synergistic combination improves outcome. Um, I think we sometimes do see it used and it might be considered in patients who remain uh, in septic shock or who are at high risk of death. Um, that recommendation, however, is a weak recommendation with low quality of evidence, but um, in that type of setting, it, it can be utilized. Um, cephalosporin should be avoided as monotherapy in situations where ESBL producing uh, gram negatives are prevalent. Uh, Carbapenems are going to be the more appropriate empiric choice in that, that particular setting. And all antibiotics should be reevaluated for clinical improvement and review of micro data at 48 to 72 hours and considered for de escalation or discontinuation uh, when the diagnosis is in doubt. Um, the recommended duration of therapy for a HAP or ventilator associated pneumonia is generally seven days. In cases uh, caused by Pseudomonas or Acinetobacter, some will recommend uh, a longer treatment course in that situation. Uh, so sort of sum summarizing and some take home points, uh, the diagnosing pneumonia, um, although it seems relatively straightforward, I think can actually be quite challenging. Um, obviously many pneumonias are caused by viruses. Uh, vancomycin may not be necessary in a lot of patients. If it's started, consider stopping it at 48 hours if the MRSA NARES is not isolated. Um, shorter course uh, regimens are usually adequate. Um, and then the biggest risk factor for the development of HAP or VAP is gonna be mechanical ventilation. This uh, I alluded to earlier, the 2007 uh, ATS IDSA guidelines for uh, community acquired pneumonia was updated in 2019. Um, this is just a table that sort of highlights some of the uh, differences between the two. Um, in terms of sputum and blood cultures, those were primarily recommended in patients with severe disease in the older guidelines. It's now recommended in patients with severe disease as well as for all inpatients empirically treated for MRSA or pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, the use of procalcitonin and the use of steroids was not covered in the old guidelines. Um, in terms of procalcitonin, uh, the new guidelines, it's not recommended to determine the need for initial therapy, um, but it can be uh, u utilized to help with your decision making. And then steroids, it's recommended not to use, but may be considered in patients with refractory septic shock. Um, obviously, the treatment for uh, severe COVID uh, is not employing that recommendation. Um, uh, the use of, uh, for healthcare associated pneumonia category, it was accepted uh, in 2007 as introduced in the 2005 uh, hospital acquired and ventilator associated pneumonia guidelines. Um, in 2019, they recommended abandoning this categorization uh, and emphasis was placed on local epidemiology and validated risk factors to determine need for MRSA or pseudomonal coverage um, with increased emphasis on de-escalation of, treat, of treatment if cultures are negative. Um, and then in terms of standard empiric therapy for severe CAP, um, beta-lactam, macrolide, uh, and beta-lactam fluoroquinolone combinations were given equal weighting 
uh, in 2019, both were, were accepted with stronger evidence in favor of the beta-lactam macrolide combination. And then uh, the routine use of follow-up chest imaging that we uh, discussed was, was not addressed in 2007, but they did address it in, um, in 2019.